Hi, I'm Alan, and welcome to another T4LT interview. I'm here with uh, DJ Henniger of Math Science Department, uh, and uh, he teaching, he's teaching nutrition and human anatomy and physiology. Is that That's right? Great. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, welcome to the studio. Thank Thanks you. for being Thanks. here. Thank you. So today we want to talk a little bit about the back channel. And I thought maybe to start I'd give a quick definition. I came up okay. with one, but then I found one that was even better. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I'll try and top that. Okay. And then, then you can <laughs> chime in with your own. Uh, the one I found, I'll share this one with you, is from todaysmeat.com. It's a website kind of dedicated to supplying back channeling. Gotcha. tools yeah. uh, and they describe the back channel as everything going on in the room that isn't coming from the presenter that's exactly what I was going to say <laughs> <laughs> anything to add to it um, just that you can add a technology piece to that too using Twitter so I think the old-fashioned back channel is all the whispering and all the passing of notes and things like that but now with technology you can actually harness that back channel bring it into the classroom bring it to the forefront and give everyone in the class kind of a voice so that's how I see it so how are you using back channel in your class? I think the first thing I want to be really clear about is that I've tried this less than a week at this point. So I, I looked at it over the summer, wanted to try it, sat down last Wednesday night and said, I'm going to look at TweetDeck, I'm going to look at Twitter and see if I can do this. And so I walked into class last Thursday and we we're going to show a film on nutrition. I think nutrition is a very nutrition in society, kind of a debate class. And so I wanted to let everyone in the class kind of have a voice in that conversation. So there's 40 people in the class. And so I just asked, how many people are on Twitter? I'm going to put TweetDeck up while we're watching this film, and you can comment as we go. So it was really very little preparation. So I just want to be really clear about that, that I don't have that much experience in it at this point. Um, I really, really liked it because I showed a film called Killer at Large that really brings up really topical things in nutrition, I think. And we watched a minute and a half of the film. We got to a point where a 12-year-old girl is having liposuction, which is stimulates the conversation and for the rest of the class we're talking an hour and 40 minutes the Twitter feed just fed the conversation so I really like it as a way for the conversation to grow from one-on-one -on -one to everyone in the room is having a similar conversation at the same time how many people had Twitter going already was it so uh, in that class about 15 people had Twitter already and so they jumped right on and 10 had devices either laptops or smartphones that would do it you can also do it with a regular phone you just need to set up the Twitter account in advance on a computer and then you can text to the Twitter feed and did you go back through that feed after class did you, did you use that information definitely that? I think that's one of the big advantages is you're archiving this conversation so in a conversation like this you're moving from topic to topic really kind of quickly so you don't really give your brain the chance to process everything but by going back through the feed you can kind of see the commentary your brain has had a chance to kind of have a more richer thought about it and I think it leads to more developed thoughts I like to revisit the, tweet, the Twitter feed so some critics of, uh, of back channeling might say it's a more of a distraction than yeah. an addition. What kind of response do you get to that? Um, I don't want to get too far off topic, but it reminds me of this guy named Richard Feynman. He always used to do these little experiments with his brain, and he found that some people can count as they read, and some people can count as they speak, but nobody can count. Nobody can do both. So what that tells me is everybody's brain is a little bit different. And so even in this classroom, I think um, some people were really on board. I really, really like it. I like having multiple streams of information coming into my brain, but some people are definitely distracted. So I think as I keep doing it, I'll evolve the method to try and still hit both those constituencies. Maybe not have the Twitter feed up on the projection screen. Maybe not at least have it have a, an audible alert. Um, but even then, the students that have their devices can be back channeling or tweeting back and forth during the conversation. Also, I don't know if I would use it during like a lecture setting, but definitely anytime there's discussion, I like having that channel open. Why wouldn't you use it in a, in a lecture? I guess that's just a matter of not having thought through that yet. So I teach anatomy and physiology, and I like it as a tool to prompt thinking, to maybe if you find a link. A link. So in nutrition, I found a link over the weekend that was tying consumption of bacon to type two diabetes. And most of us probably realize there's no connection there because bacon is full of fats and type 2 diabetes is caused by carbohydrates. So I like being able to put that article up there. Maybe some of my nutrition students see that, they're engaged by it, and then you're ready to have a conversation. So it's a way to find something and post it quickly. So I think I see that as a role in AP. 
but I guess I haven't really wrapped my brain around how to use it in that class yet. Uh, what kind of feedback are you getting from students today? They kind of like it? I think some students are definitely distracted and they're not particularly interested. I think it's a love or hate it. You either kind of love it or hate it at this point. So I think it's, I've got to do some adjustments to find the middle ground. So it's tolerated, but it's also still a tool to keep people engaged. I guess I would like to think that at some point the benefits are going to outweigh the distraction because you're seeing this other person in the classroom as a person who has thoughts rather than somebody that's sitting in front of you. Um, perhaps people can help each other out like uh, it already happened. Is this working? And then someone will respond or I responded, yes it is. And then someone else in the class does too. So I hope that the benefits outweigh the distractions at some point. Obviously as a teacher you're worried about losing control of the back channel but we already kind of do with whispering and things like that. So here's a chance to grab hold of it put it up in the front of the class and use it rather than lose it, I suppose. Do you make, um, do you make your back channeling a part of assignments or do you just kind of use it to facilitate discussion? Right. Do, you, do you actually grade the participation in the? Not yet, and that was one of the first questions is, is if I choose not to do this, is it gonna hurt me at all? And I think, like I said, our brains are just too different and some people it's wonderful for and some people it's really horrible for them and so I would not like to make that a punishment for students that it just doesn't work for them. I mean I see just as a community college instructor it's kind of our job to try and facilitate multiple types of learning and so I'm trying to facilitate a learning without as actually harming a different type of learning and so I don't think I would actually use it as grading. I've offered to do push-ups if a particular person that was really, really shy would tweet three times. I didn't have to do the push-ups. <laughs> so but shy people are still shy. But I, yeah, To some extent, but I'm hoping that that does actually give them a window, a step in the door so that they see that other people have similar thoughts and then they're more likely to bring their thoughts forward. I kind of see that as, I don't know, I was just reading last night, Carl Sagan makes this point about how when you're in kindergarten, you're always willing to ask lots and lots of questions, and then we lose that as we age. And so I'm hoping that Twitter allows kind of a, a place where it's safe to ask what you would think is a dumb question anywhere else. You lower the filter on what question is acceptable so that we get more thoughts out there. I mean, Carl Sagan said, any question is a cry for understanding. So I, any tweet to me is a, is a request for understanding. So, so I like that. Great. Well, thanks for listening to our cries for understanding about back channeling, <laughs> yeah, and uh, awesome. thanks for coming to the studio. Yeah, thank you.